Hello, hello. I hope I'm not mute. Hello, hello. <laughs> no, for once you're not. As we say here in Kenya, welcome to episode 23 of our Great Leadership Live Show, and thank you for making time to spend an hour with our guests and I this evening. The journey to finding yourself and discovering who you really are deep down and what you like or and dislike can be a lifelong undertaking. But finding yourself can help put you on the path in life you want to be on. Viewers, we need to have a discussion, a serious conversation about clutter in our lives, uh, spaces, and how this clutter affects us. It is possible to have a peaceful. Is, is it possible to have a peaceful and harmonious life by simply decluttering and organizing first your physical space, which in turn translates to you being less stressed, have more creativity, productivity, and overall wellness? Well, to talk about clutter this evening, we have in our virtual studio, Ms. Uh, Masi Njiru, Juliet Kiplagat, and uh, Ms. Pamela Adwar, who will be joining us later. And our host, the man himself, uh, Waweru Njoroge, a familiar place on our screens, and Elijah the Invisible, Karibuni. <laughs> Waweru, how are you? Yes, sir. Uh, it's been an interesting start. The week was actually okay, but the, this week, you know, Murphy's Law has kicked in today when it comes to technology for some reason. But anyway, it is what it is. You move on with life, learn, live and learn. Yes. Karibu Pamela has just joined us now. Okay. Karibu Pamela. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you have your camera, please? There you are. Hi, Pamela. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Karibu Sana. Mm -hmm. Asante. Martin, should we kick off? You know how I like to be a stickler for a good time, yeah? Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. As usual, as usual, I always like to start by saying thank you very much to our guests for taking time out of their day to join us. Um, Mondays, 7 p.m. Is, is always an interesting time to actually have guests uh, at the beginning of the week. Uh, you're going to find out this evening why, um, about the subject of hoarding and decluttering. Something I never actually stopped to think about until you start looking around your life and you start realizing there's certain traits, uh, but you'll find out more from our guests. So I'm going to ask our guests to briefly introduce themselves and what they do, and then we'll get into the show. So I'll start with the uh, last one in, Pamela. If you can just give us a brief background of what you do. Okay. Uh, my name is Pamela Dua. Uh, I call myself a community leader. I build many communities. Uh, the latest and the, not the final baby is the Hoda's support group, which is a Facebook group. Uh, I run Let's Cook Kenyan Meals, and I'm also the CEO of Spiceland, which is a catering firm. So you, you and Martin have something in common. Martin what likes to that? dabble in catering. Okay. <laughs> he likes to dabble in catering, so I, so I okay. hear. Okay. <laughs> Julia, please let us know who you are, what you do. Sorry, Julia, do you want mute? Uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Juliet Kabaka Kiplagat, and I'm glad to be part of the show this evening. Um, I do many things for life. I'm one of those girls. But what I'm totally passionate about is uh, decluttering and organizing. I'm a certified professional organizer. Um, and I stumbled on this uh, aspect of decluttering as I was uh, working with my interior design clients. And I discovered that most of their challenges were actually not paint on their walls or curtains uh, on their windows. It was because they had too much stuff in their houses. And most often, they're not all I needed to do was move a couple of things here and there, and they were they felt like they were living in a totally new space. So that for me um, was the light bulb that we do have a clutter challenge, and we need to sort it out and start talking about it. So that's why I'm here this evening. Thank you so much, Juliet. Thanks as well, Pamela. Um, I'll say once again, welcome to the show. Uh, we'll kick off. Uh, I'll start with uh, Pamela as we wait for Mercy. I want to ask this question. Um, just a brief introduction as to what actually is hoarding and why is it classified actually as a disorder? And there goes the screen up. Yes, sorry. Pamela, you're on mute. <laughs> I 
We could, yeah, we could always do like that. Is it better okay. now? <laughs> uh, you're, you're still sideways, but anyway, the, the question is, what is the, the question you is what you want to ask? Yes, we can hear you perfectly well. I was asking the question, what is hoarding <laughs> and why is it classified as a disorder? Uh, you're still on mute. Mm. Okay, we've lost Pamela. So, Julia, do you want to pick that question up? Um, yes, I can. Um, hoarding in layman's language and in the simplest terms possible is um, the inability to let go of stuff. Um, you have plenty of things in your home and especially in your living environment or in your working space. Um, You'll be surprised you even though you have a you have too much stuff going on, but it's just the step of letting go, the inability to let go. Whereas for some people, letting go of, of things physically is a very, very simple affair. I mean, it's as simple as pick and dump. For somebody else, for somebody else, else yeah. actual grief, grief, grief and um, a lot of anxiety. Um, and so it becomes a disorder in the sense that. You can imagine if you're 40 years and all your life, you all you've been doing is um, and you're not getting stuff out, out. Um, in a very short um, very time, very very up space, 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 space. Space. so that is why it is classified. Okay, uh, somebody's got their mics. I've got feedback, so I've got two machines or two devices connected at the same time. I can actually hear the echo. So, uh, so Julian, uh, given a brief insight into what coding is and why it's coding under the disorder, so Pamela, I'm going to come and ask you, ask you the question. What are the symptoms and behaviors of actual coding? Does, does anyone have a, yeah. something screaming like you can feel that? There's a second device on at the moment. Device on at the, moment. Yeah. the volume, thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So what, um, are the, what are the symptoms and behaviors of hoarders? Okay, the symptoms of hoarders are actually when you see somebody keeping things which they really don't need, and you can see, I'll give you an example of containers, like uh, uh, maybe containers for products you no longer use or things you need to throw away, but you feel that you will always use them in the future. You never get to use them but you store them. I have seen people having containers of maybe oil, maybe 20 containers which they're not using, but every time you tell them to throw it away, there is always an excuse. A holder will always have an excuse for not letting go. They always feel that uh, maybe they'll have uh, a use for an item, maybe the next day or in the future, but they never let go of any item, no matter whether they're using it or not. So what happens is that in a short while, you find a holder has no space. It is taken by things which they don't really need, but they can't let go. There's that pain in them that cannot let them let go of anything. Um, so I just want to follow up that question, Ashley, with regards to what mm. you just said. Do, yes. do holders, okay, and this is gonna be, because I've got three women on the panel today, but I want to ask the question. <laughs> Yes. The waters tend to be more <laughs> typically men or women. Typically men or women. Okay, you're on mute. Okay. Am I okay now? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, in my life, I've noticed it more with the women, maybe because I deal a lot with women and their kitchens. I've seen it a lot in the kitchens with all the plastics they keep and other things which they really don't need. So for me, I'll tell you, it's, it's more with the women than the men. There's that tendency of holding on to things that they don't need. Okay, thanks, Pamela. Julia, do you want to add something to that? You guys just leave your mics unmuted. You can hear me. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Um, the, 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 what I have experienced as I've been working with different clients is the number one excuse for hoarders is um, I might need that thing someday. That is the number one escape. That the reason why I'm holding on to 
these yogurt containers or these kasuku containers or the reason why I have, you know, um, a seat that looks like it really needs to be in the trash is I may need it someday. And another excuse I have found, and especially with the older generation of ladies, is they don't make such good quality furniture anymore. Um, so mm -hmm. I cannot afford to get rid of it because I'm not going to get that kind of quality again. I'd rather get this repaired. The challenge is it never gets done. So it, it just sits there, piles up, gathers dust, moss, even breaks apart. But this person does not want to release it because they just don't make this kind of stuff anymore. So that becomes okay. what um, you hold on to. Thank you so much, Juliet. I would like to say hello to Mercy Karibu Sana. Sorry about the connection issues. We are having technology issues across the board today, so you're not the only one. So I'd like to ask you then, uh, and before I ask you that question, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, give us a brief, we've already asked our other guests to give us a brief introduction of who they are, what they do. So I'm going to ask you to do the same, and then I'm going to follow up with a very quick question to you after that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we Good. can. Mercy. My name is Masinjiro. Thank you for uh, having. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me on the show. My name is Masinjiro, a marketing and communication specialist, but with great passion and uh, interest in uh, decluttering people's lives and spaces, and just getting to see the impact that decluttering creates in their lives and their loved ones. And I'm um, looking forward to a great discussion today. Thank you so much, Mercy. I want to ask you this question. Um, what are the consequences yeah. of hoarding? Um, and does hoarding become progressively worse? Okay, yes, it does, because it starts um, It starts slowly. You just buy items, you... Okay, you, you start by buying items you need, then slowly you progress to buying items you don't, you don't need. For instance, ladies with shoes and clothes. Um, and then at some point now it just becomes an excessive acquiring of items that eventually you might not need. Um, so it's something that progresses slowly with or without knowing, unconsciously or consciously. So it does get, like you said, it does get worse as in, the thing is, okay, there's a question. There. Oh yes, it does. It's probably, but it probably comes up a bit later on, but you might as well tackle it now. The issue of, um, you're not going to find somebody who's like five, six years old who's hoarding. Sorry, is that question directed to me? Yes, yes. I was just following up on what you're saying. I was, I was saying that it, it, does it tend to be more older people who tend to show symptoms of this or this this hoarding disorder? It's older people. I've I've not come across uh, any young one, a six or five year old, um, yeah. exhibiting those um, uh, symptoms of of hoarding. But it's more the older people, uh, age from maybe the like our parents. Um, they're the ones who keep a lot of things and they don't want to let go of them. Okay, thanks, Marcin. Welcome, welcome to the show again. Pamela, I want to jump to you and ask Thank a question. You. What are the different what are the different classifications and descriptions of people who hoard? I'll go back to what Marcy was saying. I've mm -hmm. seen people in my group saying they are not hoarders, but they are handling kids who are hoarders. There are okay. cases of children who will not let go of their dolls. I have an issue with my son who will not let go of his uh, cars, his robots, however broken they are. It's like you have to do it when he's away. He'll always have an excuse whenever you want to take it. So I believe you can have young holders. They are not only the older people. So, uh, yeah. so, so Okay, I want to follow up okay, on that. Follow up you on just that. mentioned the word dolls, and it triggered something I just I came across. Um, yes. There's a couple called Bob and Lacey Gibson, mm -hmm. who have 240 love dolls, valued at 160,000 US dollars. These are life-size dolls, so they must take up a lot of space in somebody's house. Uh, you had mentioned mm -hmm. examples of hoarders, but I wanted to find out from you, and actually I'm going to ask Juliet and Mercy as well, what examples of extreme hoarding have you actually come across? What are the weirdest or the most you know, out of out of out of the out of the box kind of hoarders that you've seen or examples you can give. So I'll start with Pamela, then move to Juliet and come to Mercy. The packets of Unga. You find somebody making chapatis and they have all the packets. 
of the Ungas they have used for a whole year or more years. So that took me back and I was wondering, what are you going to do with these packets? So that was really worrying because this is a person who buys Unga maybe every two days and they keep on keeping those packets. So it was um, the holding thing came about when people started see, showing signs of um, brand loyalty. That's what they called it. But to me, it was actually holding because I don't understand why you are keeping packets of, uh, of bread or packets of Unga or packets of yogurt. So those are things which I really couldn't understand. So I think it's extreme, especially the one for Unga and the one for bread packets. One of those ones which I thought was crazy. Okay. Juliet, what is your extreme example of, of hoarding? Um, I think I've... Uh, I've uh, the person who I know has uh, had a client who had a serious um, book hoarding situation. Um, and um, they were swamped with books. Every corner you look, there are books, there are books, there are books. Um, and um, I, I sought to ask, um, I mean, are you a lecturer? Are you, you know, are you in, um, I mean, are you a researcher? Why? What is this? Uh, and it's all manner of books. It's either novels, um, self-help, just books. And um, they told me that they will get to read them at some point. Um, and then I noticed that uh, uh, on this person's bedside table, they had about, you know, like three or four books. Um, and I asked, so why are these books here? And they say, because I'm reading all of them. Um, and, and I kind of doubt that because some of them still look like they even have the seal on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I realized as I went on engaging this person, um, for them, buying books is retail therapy. So when they're going through a season in their life, what they do is they buy books. So okay. they have an entire bathroom um, that is absolutely functional but cannot be used right now because it's mm -hmm. full to the rafters with books and they cannot let go of those books. Okay. Um, and I think I've had a scenario uh, of uh, also kitchen, um, you know, the yogurt uh, cups and the Java cups in, I mean, in the hundreds. Um, and they also could not explain why they are holding on to them. Because the one thing that I always seek to ask my clients, before we even mm -hmm. get to the point of let's declutter, why do you have this stuff? And frankly, I never quite get an answer. There's no concrete answer why. And that's how I get to know that either they do not realize that they're beginning to get into a hoarding problem, because there's a difference between a clutterer and a hoarder. Mm -hmm. yes. Those are, it begins with clutter. It begins with one thing, two books, five books. Before you know it, uh, your bedside table is completely full. Before you know it, the books are on the floor and on and on and on. Um, so every time I ask somebody, why do you have the stuff in excess? And they can't quite explain why they, they do. Okay. But I've seen books and paper. I don't know what it is with paper. And paper is with guys. <laughs> True. Yeah. True. Really? Yeah. Okay. Martin would have to be. Can you can confess to that? Maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, okay, Mercy. Let's get your example of extreme hoarding. Okay, for me, I'd actually like to echo what Juliet has said. Yeah, in terms of paper mm -hmm. and newspaper, men men are the ones that. Is it hold or just just have a lot of newspaper even from 10 years ago? I don't know why they keep them for that long. Um, but uh, an extreme case that I've handled of uh, a whole... Oh, Mercy, we seem to have lost you. Yeah. We've lost Mercy again. She was getting into that question. She was getting into that answer. Um, I'm going to come to the aspect of decluttering. I can't say that word at the most point in time. Uh, but I wanted to ask Juliet, because um, we seem to have lost Mercy. Okay, we seem to have lost Mercy. Um, the question about, I asked that question slightly earlier, uh, about the classifications and descriptions of people who hoard. Um, hoarding has different levels. Um, and uh, ideally, it's hoarding level one all the way to hoarding level five. Um, and holding level one just, um, and, and ideally how all these, the, the, the five levels are classified is um, contained in the intensity of the stuff that you have uh, within your space. Um, and I suppose, um, ideally, 
as you progress. Um, when you're at level one, um, you have, you know, in excess of, of staff, but your staff has not gotten, gotten to the point of impeding um, your, your space within your house and impeding the space of the other people that you live with. But as you progress on to two, to three, to four, up to five, um, it goes getting worse. With holding level five being a scenario where you barely have zero space to navigate. So all your, what you've actually done is had to move out of your living accommodations to go live elsewhere because your home is full to the rafters with all manner of junk. Um, it, and it begins with um, empty papers, food, um, pets that are probably dying along the way, um, furniture, and on and on and on. If, if you've watched, um, there's a program that used to, uh, I think it still comes on DSD, we call Hoarders. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and what is shown most on cable uh, channels, um, on the, there's one I was watching on YouTube the other day, those are at hoarding at level five where um, the house is completely full to the extent that you have a random thing like a television out of the house, not inside the house. Uh, mm -hmm. If you live in a space, you know, that has acreage, you have vehicles, you have trucks, you have tractors, you have all manner of things. And that space now becomes unlivable and you have to move. Um, now, in this country, I personally haven't encountered anybody who's at that level. Um, mm -hmm. But as I've done my research, I've realized that in uh, in America and I think in Britain, by the time you get to level uh, three, um, let's say level four, um, the mm -hmm. authorities actually now begin to give you notices, not notifications that if you do not get help and if you do not get stuff out of your space, they will reclaim mm -hmm. your property. And that is when now you begin to see now um, uh, professional organizers and psychotherapists come into the picture. Here, I don't think uh, we are at that level, uh, but I think it's because we don't talk too much about it. Maybe if we mm -hmm. did a little bit more research, it's not hard for you to find somebody who moved out of their home because their home is no longer livable. It's full to the rafters with stuff. Actually, there was a, yeah, some extreme cases where people are finding like 14 cats that had passed away and they're still in the, in the, in the house and everything. And that's, that's a bit worrying to say the least. Yeah. Uh, Mercy, you're back. Are you with us for a long time? Okay, that answers my question. So let me <laughs> ask this asked. question to Pamela. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask Pamela this question. I'm gonna come back to Mercy. I'm gonna start switching the gears now to decluttering and then I'll come back to, to hoarding. So Pamela, I wanted to ask you, how does a person, and this is something that, uh, something that Juliet was answering that triggered the question. Um, and she mentioned the aspect of family. How does a person with hoarding disorder affect the lives and families uh, of the pe of people around them. So I'm a hoarder, how does that affect my family? Space-wise, that is the uh, first and most common is space-wise. They are most times emotionally unstable. Uh, you see like when you are cleaning, you take out a container, that hurts them to the core. So they are emotionally unstable, and uh, so sometimes you don't know how to handle such a person in the family. And also issues of maybe if uh, you need the space, you can't get the space because they have kept their things which they are not using. So most times it's, uh, they, they tend to be the unhealthy people in the family. So you have to treat them carefully. Because uh, uh, touching or throwing away one of their items can trigger a lot of emotional effects. The, uh, the people who are emotionally unstable so have to be controlled. I'm going to come to the psychology a bit later. Um, I'm going to come to the psychology a bit. There's something okay. I wanted to ask Mercy, but she has. She has <laughs> okay. Yeah, Mercy is here. Okay, fine. No problem. Um, then let me ask Mercy this question. Uh, I'll start now the conversation about decluttering. And I want to go to the other extreme. Now you have hoarders and then you have people who are compulsive declutterers. And then we'll go into the aspects of how people do the decluttering. So there's, there's the extreme side of things. How does, the, how does a, a compulsive declutterer look like? 
a compulsive declutterer uh, who more, more than often often refer them as also OCD are people that just love okay and for the, for um, in this instance I'm not describing people that love their spaces neat and clear but I'm mm. describing people that um, you you just want to get rid of things just for the sake of getting uh, rid of things and then at some point it um, it uh, what it, it disables you. For instance, you get rid of a lamp that um, is functional, and then when you don't have electricity, you don't have a lamp, but you just let it go just because you wanted to let go. And then there's also an instance where you just want to get rid of things so that you can purchase. And we lost mercy. Uh, so let me come now to to Juliet, and we start with the aspect of decluttering where. Where does one start? I know there's something to do with a Japanese system where you can you put your hand over a certain item and if it doesn't doesn't make you feel happy or something, you can start there. Is it Marie Kondo or something like that? But then let's let's start with now fine, I'm a hoarder, and there's the psychological effect, which we'll touch on. But uh, in the interest of time, then I'd like to say then how do you then where do you start um, if you're starting to do decluttering? Okay, first, um, I'd like to, to differentiate the difference between hoarding and cluttering. Okay. And ideally, all of us in this panel have cluttered to some extent. Okay. And uh, the reason why I say you cannot escape clutter is because you're living. For as long as you're alive, you will have clutter around you because, say, especially ladies, uh, if I step out, in, out of my house in the morning, I will only carry my bag and go about my business. But when I come back in the evening, I'll come back holding two, three bags of stuff, either groceries, or I found a nice a shoe for my child or for myself and I buy. Um, and what happens is the rate with which we bring stuff into our homes is not the same rate with which we get stuff out of our homes. That's how we end up finding ourselves in a cluttered environment or in a cluttered situation. Um, and what happens uh, if you keep doing that on a day to day and you never quite have an exercise that you're saying you want to get stuff, get rid of some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, you kind of get used to having stuff around you. You become what, what is called clutter blind. Um, mm -hmm. That it becomes very normal for you to have things around you, for you to have to you know always have amount of clothes on your bed. So when you're going to sleep, um, you push them aside on one corner and well, depending on whether you're married or not, and maybe you're probably thrown your spouse out of the space because your bed has more clothes than space to sleep on, you know? So that's how you end up now moving from a cluttered situation to slowly, as the years go by, getting into a hoarding situation. Now, before okay. um, before you get into the hoarding situation, that's where uh, Juliet comes in. And I tell you, if we don't get this in check, we are very slowly going to start getting into a scenario where your, your the stuff around your house is going to be completely unmanageable mm -hmm. um and so i start i, I my um i have a 21 day um decluttering challenge that I run, and it begins with the most mundane things um like when you wake up in the morning you make your bed okay yeah, an okay. activity as simple as make your bed because if you don't mm -hmm. make your bed in the morning it means after you go about your day a day like today with you know stuff then you come home in the evening and you want to you know just grab a bite and go to bed. And then you get mm -hmm. to your room and your bed is exactly the way you left it in the morning and probably has more stuff on it. What does that do to your bike, to your psychological and your mental state? It doesn't give you rest uh, at, at all. So my suggestion normally is, how about you start with making your bed in the morning? Simple things. When you undress um, in the evening and uh, your clothes are dirty, put them in the dirty clothes uh, bin or hang them immediately do the things that you can do immediately don't say mm. i'll put let me put them there on the couch i'll deal with them later that's how the letter becomes three weeks later now you have a mountain full of stuff okay. but yeah. my first point of decluttering and for you to start um and mm. do it successfully is address your why why do you have mm. clutter in the first place what's your trigger okay all of us okay. have triggers yes all of us have triggers my trigger is i love sales Anytime there's a sale, I'm down for the sale. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether that's what I was going to buy or not. So yeah, if that's yeah. it, I know my trigger, um, and I'm going to a mall to buy whatever, I immediately 
stop myself from, ah, ah, that's not where we're going. We're going to buy milk and then we go home. But if I'm not aware, my natural the, um, default would be, let's go check out what's happening in the sale. So what ends up yeah. happening is I already have cups and plates in my house, but I want to buy more because they're on it's a deal. I can get six cups for 500, okay? Why not? And I add them onto the pile that I already have in my house. So first things first, understand your why. When you understand your why, then you're able to stop yourself from bringing mm. stuff in and not getting stuff out. Okay, Mercy, yeah. um, something that uh, now, what, what Julia has said, where if you know where to start and why you're doing it, then how do you move on to the aspect of deciding what you want to discard? And I said discard, not throw away, but I suppose you could always give it to a, a children's home or something like that. Uh, but in the aspect of deciding what to discard um, and what is it, what's the best approach to choose? Uh, do you choose what you want to keep or do you choose what you want to dispose of? Okay. Uh, for me, when I'm dealing with clients and we've like sorted stuff out and when um, we've like we put stuff together, um, the clutter together, I tell them to cut like we, we categorize together. So they stuff to donate, they stuff to sell, they stuff to keep, and they start to and they stuff to just give away. Uh, mm -hmm. So once we yeah, so once we categorize the stuff like that, then you're able to like now when you're picking stuff up, you, you just put like a like, like a pla like a placard, and then you pick the items one by one and just ask them. So this are you keep are you selling? Are you keeping? Are you donating like that? So it becomes easy for them as well to make that decision while you're there. Okay, but then obviously, then it, it, like Juliet does, you you when you say you have clients, you actually it's because it's a disorder, it's treated as like like a disease. So you actually have to hold somebody's hand while they're actually going through this exercise. Yeah, yeah? Uh, Juliet, you'd agree with that as well. Yes, because um, because you do it. I mean, because I'm wondering whether there's some people who then you see now the family doesn't understand that somebody who's holding, they're not doing it out of volition, um, and to somebody who's holding. Uh, they might get stuff that might not necessarily have any value to anybody else, but it has value to them. So now let's look at that aspect of the dynamic of the family again, in terms of this is somebody who's not wanting to do it on purpose. So how do you then bring in, if you were to bring in the dynamic of the family and say, okay, fine, this person has a, a hoarding disorder, uh, but we need you to hold his hand, because you're not going to be there with them 24 seven. So you need to also train the family in terms of how to deal with that person. Um, I think when I have um, the clients that I've had, I've had clients who have um, sought me out uh, mm -hmm. because they have gotten to the point of realizing that their their lack of um, inability to let go is actually mm -hmm. now beginning to cause a strain in their families. And uh, what happens um, in a scenario like that is I... I try as much as possible not to use the term hoarding when I'm when I'm working with a client who, of course, I can see um, uh, probably because uh, this is work that I've done for a while. Um, mm -hmm. Coincidentally, I'm also um, a psychology graduate. That's what I did in school. So I am I'm kind of able to tell that this is just not your regular clutterer. This one has not mm -hmm. gotten into the hoarding disorder situation. So the way you approach these people is very different. First of all, you cannot. The minute you call somebody a hoarder, right there, you've yeah. branded them. And they're already mm -hmm. feeling attacked. They're already feeling like I'm sick, I have a problem. So they're they are already um, sort of relating to you from a very defensive point of view. But you have to sort of, um, what do they call it? You know, though you talk to a small child and you're trying to embeleza them to do something. Yes. You kind of have to talk to them and try to understand how did they get here in the first place. Just, you know, sort of engage them in a story. And just seek, you cannot walk into somebody's house and say, my God, what kind of mess? You know, already you have judged them. And at that point, they've thrown you out of the house. You're not even going to go past the door. But uh, you walk in and you, you know, um, sort of compliment them on a beautiful piece they have in their house. So that's nice. But you do get that from. And the stories mm -hmm. begin. When they realize that this is a, 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 a safe space, this person is not judging me. They're here to help me. Because trust me, a hoarder knows they have a problem. They know that their hoarding uh, issue and their inability to let go is affecting other people in their family. If it hasn't already, probably a marriage has broken up. You probably have children that don't come and visit you anymore. 
of course, because you are ashamed uh, of, of the space and how it looks like you no longer have people visiting you. So they are aware of what's happening in their lives. So you cannot go there with a judgmental point of view. Just try to find out what happened. How did we get here? And they'll right. tell you, and one story morphs into another story, morphs into another story. And slowly you ask, how would you feel if we let go of this thing? And they'll tell you, it gives me grief. I'd I, I have a panic attack because, or they tell you, oh, that's easy. I can let go of that. And they do it. Now, when they let go of a small piece of paper, they realize, oh, this thing is not that complicated. And they do mm. another and another. But when they get to a point where the anxiety checks in, they'll tell you, no, I'm feeling anxious. Stop. That's not the okay. part. That's not the time to say, let's go on. Mm. So you work yeah, at their yeah. and slowly. They, they, they kind of just adapt to, they need help and you're there to help them. Okay, but, and Pamela had mentioned this before, and this is a question I want to ask Mercy. What happens if you have somebody who has this disorder? I'm not gonna call them hoarders, they have a, a, a hoarding disorder. Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, what happens, yeah, inability to let go, that's the one, okay, fine. What happens when you, if you were to then just cut them off cold turkey as and say, you know what, I'm tired of you, taking up space, whatever, and then literally grab all their stuff and just throw it out. What kind of effect would that have on, on, on somebody who has this disorder? No, first and foremost, I think it's just fair for you to be uh, compassionate and just uh, show sympathy to these people. And you can't go all harm on them like that. Remember, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. It's an issue to have, yeah? So um, instead of, um, for me, I'd, because I'm sure if you go all harm, for instance, maybe it's someone who keeps uh, holds clothes or shoes. I mean, mm. what would stop them from going out again and buying the shoes and holding them again? You understand? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just take them slow. Don't rush them because eventually you might cause a conflict between, I mean, let's say if it's a family member or a friend, you might lose a friend just because you were not uh, compassionate and understanding um, just while dealing with them and just helping them dealing with this issue. So I don't think it's, it's it's fair to go all harm on them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is a very nice answer. Uh, Pamela, welcome back. I hope we're going to keep you a bit longer. No, nope, we've lost Pamela again. This is a very interesting show today. Um, and this goes back then, Julia, I'll come back to you with regards to what you said mentioned about the reality shows um, yeah. and hoarders. Um, and I want to ask a question, are these reality shows actually beneficial or detrimental in nature? And this is where it comes to what you'd mentioned about being stigmatized. Uh, you see it and you either, people say, okay, I'm not as bad as that, or I wish I, I wish them all the best, or you feel the way for them. But does it create a sense of awareness or does it then say, these people should be, should be kept away with a 10 foot barge pole or whatever the case may be? Um, I think I, I prefer the shows keep running. For me, I think it's a good mm. thing because mm. number one, it puts um, information out there on how to handle mm. relatives or friends or people that have this. Um, when you watch this, these shows, I watch them not necessarily because of what I do, but I, I, I mean, it's an interesting thing for me to just see how people struggle and relate to different things. Uh, but as you're watching this show, you're actually able to relate it to somebody that either you know, somebody you are related to, and you and step by step. Because again, on these shows, you know, for it's not normally, it's not drama, it's not a reality show. It's there are psychotherapists involved, there are professional organizers involved. There's an entire crew that kind of teaches you on how to handle a, a situation, a holding situation, or a person who has a holding disorder. Um, you see, if it was one of those random reality shows, then you say, okay, these ones look like they're trying to make fun of an otherwise not fun thing. But in this case, it's very, for me, it's very educative. And I think the more people talk about it, um, the more information is put out there, the more you also begin to look at your space and ask yourself one or two things. Am I borderline crossing over from a clutterer to a hoarder? Um, is, is my excessive collection of shoes and handbags and whatever affecting other members of my family. If you have taken over the wardrobes in the entire house and people, your, the, the rest of your household has to put their stuff in suitcases and boxes, then you need to check yourself at that point. But if that is not sensitized to you, for you it's normal. If you're believing like that for five, ten years, you don't really realize mm. the effect you have on your relatives. So I think for me, the more the shows can be done, the more the information is out there, 
um, the more people actually begin to now take active steps to improve their lives. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Philip. Uh, Pamela seems to disappear. <laughs> get back. Um, I'll, I'll get to Mercy now that she's back online. Um, with regards to the, with regards to the Shilashi, Pamela, you are on your discussion. Philip uh, has been talking. We just talk, uh, we're just talking about the reality shows in terms of shows where people see how people mm. who have disorder, uh, hoarding disorder live. But I want to ask a question about how common is hoarding in third world countries such as Kenya. All things considered, it's not like we have you know a lot of money to go and whatever. But I suppose you don't have to spend money to be a hoarder. But the question is, how common is hoarding in third world countries? So that's for Pamela, or I? That's for Pamela. That's for Pamela. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it is common, maybe from our background. Most of us come mm -hmm. from. Uh, uh, I think poverty stricken backgrounds. So whenever you get something, you always uh, don't want to let go. Some of us take it like uh, when you let go, you'll go back to your poverty zone to call, maybe to the um, where you started. Let's say you were not able to buy a tin of margarine and now you are able to buy. You'll always feel like um, you can't let go of this container because you used to use it before and now you don't need it, but uh, because of your that needy background, you don't want to move on. You just want to be at that space whereby it was hard for you to buy this team. Now you have it, so you don't want to let go thinking that you'll go back where you are. So the, it has something to do with um, the needy background that some people came from whereby mm -hmm. now you, what we call you are poor at heart. Whether you move to another level where you can afford some things, you still feel like this tin of margarine, which I used not to be able to afford now that I can afford it, I don't want to let it go back because I never had it. Now that I have it, I can have some more. So you start getting to the habit of keeping because you used to treasure this one tin when you used to buy it, maybe one tin in every six months. Now you can buy every two weeks, but your mind has not moved to the new status where now you can buy every two weeks. So you tend to hold on to that item. So I think it's, it's getting very common in these third world countries, if you ask me, because I've seen okay. it happen. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pamela. Mercy, I want to ask you this question. What are some of those misconceptions about hoarding that you think are out there? Uh, first and foremost, hoarders are collectors. Hoarders are not collectors. Collectors have their things neatly placed. Hoarders have their things just all over the place and just mountains and piles of things uh, in, in a place. And then the second thing is um, that hoarders are lazy and dirty and unmotivated. I don't think that's true because most holder spaces are clean, like, uh, unfortunately. Um, then the other thing is uh, that uh, cleaning will help solve the problem for holders. No, 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 it won't. And uh, then the other thing is um, what people with holding need is compassion, sympathy, and support, and not, um, and not uh, to be forced to, to, to deal with their disorder. Okay, thanks, Mercy. Uh, Julia, there's an interesting question here I want to ask you. How much how much more complex does hoarding disorder become when it knocks on the door with its relas? These relas I'm talking about uh, anxiety, depression, all those kind of things. So you, you get hit with a double whammy or, whatever the, or triple whammy, as it were. Um, and then also, as a follow-up to that question, what do, you, what do you tackle first? you tackle the aspect of anxiety and depression that take uh, the, the hoarding disorder or do you tackle them all at the same time? Um, in most cases, when you get to the root cause of hoarding, um, it actually is caused by either some level of anxiety you have in your life or some form of depression you're dealing with in your life. And uh, if you get to the root cause of how somebody began, because like I, like I said, when we started, you don't just wake up one morning and you're a hoarder. It's some, something must have triggered that. And most often than not, it's either you lost a job that you are not prepared for, you lost a spouse you are not prepared for, um, you know, you probably got a disease 
uh, or rather you were diagnosed with a certain condition, there's a life change that has that happened in your life that shook you and you didn't quite know how to handle that. And to and to fill that gap and to fill that void, you began to replace that with staff. And before you knew it, you were overwhelmed with staff and you didn't know how to deal with the stuff that, that, that surrounded you. So in most cases, hoarding um, and the anxiety condition, uh, a hoarder will most likely suffer from anxiety and depression um, or um, is hoarding because uh, as a reaction of a depressive situation they have in their lives. So I think first things first is to, again, the probing questions, what happened? How did we get here? And they'll be very open. They'll tell you, um, I lost a child. Um, I went through a miscarriage, this and that happened. And I couldn't release these things. And I felt like I did. And it sort of just blew up and, and went on and on. So you can't tackle one and not tackle the other. Yeah, they are, you, you kind of have to deal with it. And that's the reason why um, if you encounter a person with a body disorder, unless you have a training in, a, you know, you're a psychotherapist, yes. uh, you might not want to start getting, uh, you might want to refer that person to somebody who is trained to handle right. the psychotherapy part. Because it's not just about removing things and tossing them. You have to deal with this person's mental state first before you can even okay. get into the physical dealing with stuff. So if uh, in situ situations where I've, I've, I've encountered people that have a holding disorder, I have certainly tried to suggest whether or not maybe we can speak to somebody together. Of course, me being the, the, the familiar face, then we're able mm -hmm. to handle this together. But I don't encourage trying to get into you know, a holder's space and trying to get like, yeah. your mental capacity, and I'm not trained to do that. That can okay. be detrimental both to you and to the person. Okay, thank you so much, Juliet. Uh, Pamela, I want to ask you the question, why is it that there seems to be a sense of shame around hoarding? Um, most times you find hoarding is associated with um, untidiness, is associated with the lack of control. Um, I've seen so many people being told when they let go of items and somebody comes and randomly tells you, you this is not hoarding, this is being dirty, this is not being able to clean up. So you see most hoarders uh, do this behind their doors and some people have rooms where they put things and actually lock so that nobody ever knows they are hoarders. Because most people judge you for being a hoarder, not understanding that it's not um, voluntary, it's um, a disorder. Most people don't know it's a disorder. So anybody who is a hoarder actually feels the shame of coming out to say they are one. Because the society actually judges you on the fact that uh, you are untidy, you have no control of your surrounding, you are lazy. So most people don't get to understand what you're going through, why you can't let go. So that's why most of them keep it to themselves. Okay. Thank you so much, family. Mercy, I want to ask the question about whether, given this topic today, I mean, like I said, I, I it, it's very interesting because this is the first time I've actually mm. examined it at that point. But I want to ask, the same way we have Alcoholics Anonymous, because it's a, it's a disease or whatever the case may be. Is there anything in Kenya that actually helps people, like you were to say, uh, Hoarders Anonymous, uh, if we have any kind of support groups in Kenya? Um, I think this uh, discussion was long overdue. I mean, having a decluttering uh, company and offering those services, it's been such a difficult journey, just convincing people and just explaining to people what, I mean, why they need these services and just why they need the help and just even telling them that they need the help. So I've never heard of any anonymous holders program. And I feel, I feel mm -hmm. like after this discussion, um, for Juliet and, uh, what's her name? And, and Pamela, Pamela, I think it would be just, yeah, yeah, and Pamela, I think it would be ideal for people to just start, um, create programs and just enhance community programs to make people aware of, uh, 
I mean, just just awareness, create awareness around what hoarding is, what the, what what clutter is, uh, why they need to declutter, why they need to deal with hoarding issues, and yeah, just informing them, just giving them information. Okay, thanks, Mercy. I want to shift gears now to look at the aspect of. Okay, we looked at uh, the disorder of hoarding. We looked at the aspect of declutter. I want to now look at the treatment uh, in terms of how you actually go about treating somebody with this disorder. So, Juliet, I want to ask the question: What are the prescribed processes when treating a person with a hoarding disorder? Um, the the treatment that I that I have read um, and I have seen to work is uh, involving a professional, um, a psychotherapist. Um, and there's what is called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CPT. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. really therapy via talking. Because what you're trying to do is get this person to open up to you as much as possible for you to be able to understand how they got to where they are at. And uh, also try to understand um, the dynamics of this person's life. So it's... it's um, it's really therapy. Uh, it can be done either in a group setting, one on one, either between the therapist and the, uh, uh, the person with the holding disorder, and and their family. And then what most often than not, it begins really with the therapist just having a session with um, uh, the person with the holding disorder. And sometimes it can even be a very complicated journey to even get this person to agree to speak to a therapist. So um, that's why, like Marcy was saying, it's it's not one of those things that it's you know pick and drop. Let's just you know, they they know they have a they have a challenge. Um, I prefer to call them challenges than problems because again, if you call it a problem, you've branded yeah, the person. Yeah. So okay. um, for them to understand that they have a challenge letting go of of things, and when it, and, and it moves only not only from physical things to you know emotionally, mentally. You just don't let go of stuff and it weighs you down slowly. So when this person begins to see the effect that this disorder is having, their inability to let go is having on their own lives and then mm -hmm. in turn on other people's lives, they can begin to agree to do one or two things. It's it's a process. It's not a thing that takes a day. It doesn't even take a week. It takes up to months sometimes, depending on uh, how good the person is, uh, uh, is in the session that they cooperate um, and these sessions are most often than not held in the premises, the place that they're dealing with, so that they, they can be able to see. Because um, if you come for therapy in my office and my office is nice and dirty and clean, um, then you go back to what you're used to. You can't quite relate what they're talking about. But if you can actually have the sessions in the space that that uh, that needs tackling and that needs handling, this person may actually be uh, in a better position to listen to. So it involves a lot of, it's actually called um, talking therapy, you know, as okay. you talk through, then uh, most often they're not actually, you're the one who comes up with the solutions to your problem, but there needs mm. to be somebody to be able to ask the right question and in the right way. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, Pamela, I want to ask this question, uh, or rather, first of all, make the statement, it wasn't until 2013 uh, that hoarding was given its own diagnostic criteria. In the past, it was just classified as an OCD. Has the fact that it's been given its own distinctive criteria benefited people with hoarding disorder? I think this also goes back to what Mercy was saying about creating this awareness. Uh, yeah, until 20, 2013 was not considered, but now that it's been considered a disorder, um, how beneficial has it been to people who actually have uh, the disorder? I believe it's easier when you uh, go to a therapist, they tend to understand. And when you have sessions, even with little, little groups, it's, uh, you're able to talk about it specifically away from OCD and just concentrate on the fact that holding has nothing to mm -hmm. do with OCD per se. It is something which is very different from OCD. and. Uh, the fact that it can be given specific attention actually is a benefit to those who are suffering from the hoarding. Okay, then I wanted to ask a question to Mercy. Uh, it's a bit of a morbid question. Um, I know there have been instances of it, but I don't know whether maybe you have personally come across it, but a hoarding that leads to death, 
this person. Somebody who's going to live a natural life, obviously, is going to pass away. But as a result of hoarding, people who lose their lives as a result of hoarding. Mm. Yes, um, I think, let me just refer to the story of Zit Kolya, the, the two American brothers um, yeah. that, were, that were compulsive uh, hoarders. And they actually died uh, from their own clutter. And actually died from their own clutter. Like they were found dead on the floor, being like having been covered by over 140 tons of just the clutter they had in the house. So that's one wow. case. But that said, uh, but that said as well, uh, because mm -hmm. um, uh, in a hoarder space, the space is very congested. It's full of stuff and clutter. So um, the air doesn't flow freely. So you, you might end up having difficulty breathing, respiratory problems that eventually make you to death. Or then another instance is uh, you might trip and fall, uh, but maybe in very rare cases die, but that can be a scenario as well. Yeah, so those are some of the cases I feel like um, coding can actually cause death if not, um, if not attended to. Okay, thanks, Mr. Julia. I want to ask the question now. Then, if you get to a point where you actually your life is in danger, where does it then become a point where you actually have to get somebody to step in to say this person is a danger to themselves as a result of this disorder? Would it then be requirement to either have them not committed or be put in the program? But you see, I'm going with this question where where, it, where it's endangering your life. Where do you have to step in and say we have to either we have to institutionalize them or something to that effect? Um, that's uh, I, I think I, I referred to that earlier. Um, mm. In this country, we don't have, we don't talk too much about body, we don't talk too much about clutter. And in as much as we may have extreme holders and, uh, you know, that live in those kinds of dangerous environments, um, we uh, we may not be able to have the, the what do you call it, a mechanism to sort of uh, forcefully get them out of that very dangerous uh, situation. Because um, even as a government, I don't think I've ever had, um, you know, even Ministry of Health trying to refer to to dangers of hoarding and, and, and uh, living in cluttered environments. Different from uh, um, the US and, and in Britain, that there are actually regulations, either county regulations or state regulations, um, like the city council uh, authorities in, in the respective uh, states and uh, countries that have a sort of guidelines, you know, almost like fire guidelines, um, mm -hmm. like fire exits must be clear. There are those kinds of guidelines and, and they and they narrow down all the way down to residential premises, like in an estate, where if I have a neighbor who's a hoarder, of course, if there are, if their neighbors, most often than not, I know they have a, a clutter challenge because it probably spills over into, into my personal space. You can report to the authorities and they come mm -hmm. and they give, they're given citations and you're told you've been given a month to clear up um, or uh, you're given, they tell you they will send you to a, a psychiatric uh, institution for evaluation. Once you're mm -hmm. sent to the psychiatric uh, place for evaluation and maybe they say you really don't have a psychology, uh, a mental problem, uh, you're not fit for com to be committed um, then they tell you, they put you in a program, almost like probation, and they tell you you need to go to that space, uh, your house, um, every day, 8 mm -hmm. o'clock to 5 o'clock, and clear out your stuff, and you're told you've been given one month. If the clutter in your house is not out in a month, the county repossesses your entire property. And in this period of time that you've been, uh, that you're put on a program, you're not allowed to live in that house. Uh, either you live with a relative or the state gets you some place to live within within that duration of time. So that way, and they try to tell you that it's not because we're trying to punish you, it's because we realize that this environment is a, is a danger to yourself and to your neighbors. So if we don't deal with it, we're going to deal, uh, we'll have to, it will now be a lethal case where somebody has died or a fire has begun because you left the gas running and so on and so forth. So in this country, I don't think we have, we don't even have the capacity to do those kinds of things. But right. um, in European countries, um, they do have those mechanisms and they're able to check um, the specific people in, in place. Okay, thank you so much, Juliet. Uh, I want to yeah. wind it up. And there's, I've seen a few messages here from people who say some of, somebody, the relatives or the dad is a serial hoarder. Um, 
so I want to ask this question, and this is open. So I'll say first come first. Sir. So if someone's watching tonight uh, and they're ready to seek help, uh, either for their loved ones or perhaps for themselves, they might be one of those people who has, uh, what is it, um, high insight, or non-insightful or insightful, but motivated, insightful and motivated, but non-compliant. Um, so if we have those kind of scenarios, what are the first steps they can take to get help? Mercy, do you want to start that off? Okay. Um, I think the first thing is for me is just allow them to get sick and tired of getting sick and tired of their clutter. And um, if possible, just let them let them be the ones um, prompting prompting themselves for to are yeah, prompting themselves to get help. Um, they have to be willing to let go and uh do not force them do not uh do not force them or do, do not force them to sorry um hello no we can hear you we can hear you yes oh, okay yeah no the, uh, no it's because i can hear you at the back one i was going to say if you can hear me <laughs> so first good okay so first and foremost yeah. just let them let them let them get tired of just sick and tired of their clutter and their and their and their stuff and then once they realize they have a problem obviously you having have guided them um do not force them into it do not force them on what to get rid of slowly walk with them through the journey um also um as as you walk them through the journey learn to learn to appreciate the small victories. For instance, uh, if you find something is gone today or they're willing to take something out, um, please appreciate them for that. And also make sure the minute they start saying they want to get rid of this, please make sure you get rid of it there and then. Because if right. you give them a chance to sleep over it or even five seconds just to think over it, they'll want to retain it once more. So once they're ready to just uh, walk the journey, um, Work with them slowly. Don't rush it. Uh, let uh, let it be a slow process, um, and obviously, and, and obviously, just acknowledging the small little victories as you go as you go on. Okay, um, Pamela, do you have anything to add to that in terms of what are the first steps people can take uh, to get help? Maybe to join support groups um, if they can. It helps. It can help you from moving from point uh, level one to two to three to four. So I've seen people turning around at level one or level two. So if you can join support groups, it would be helpful. Because some people don't actually know their holders. So you can't wait for them to get to level five. Try and support them at level one. Okay. Yeah, like I think it had been mentioned at the very beginning of the show. Yeah, you don't know. You don't wake up and you, you have a stamp mm. on your forehead saying, I, I'm a hoarder or whatever the case may be. So that's, that's, that's I like that. Uh, Juliet, last but not least. Um, I think it's also just trying to employ and create daily habits, even yourself, um, and teach the person who you think has a problem to create daily habits that will help them escape getting to the level five uh, part of hoarding. Um, it's so easy to just flip the script and turn this thing around and just begin to employ simple habits. For instance, um, if you bring a pair of shoes into your house, get a pair of shoes out of your house. Okay. For me in my house, it's for every one thing I bring, I take two out of the same kind. So mm -hmm. what you're doing in that way, you're kind of refreshing what you have without necessarily adding on to what you have, okay? Um, small things, um, making your bed in the morning um, when you get up. Um, things like uh, pick it up as, as, you're, you know, as you go along. If you come in through the door and you find a stack of envelopes that have bills and stuff that needs attention, <coughs> um, attend to them immediately and then put them in a particular place. But more importantly, make sure there's a home for everything in your house. The way you have a home to go to, make sure mm. everything in your home has a home. Like there's a particular place where you put shoes, okay? And everybody in your house knows that when we remove shoes, we put them in that corner. When we come from work, uh, we remove our handbags, we put them, we hang them on a certain hook. Um, our car keys go on a certain spot on the wall. And it will save you, slowly, you will begin to realize you're creating habits that will 
very quickly stop you from getting to the hoarding situation. Um, okay. So that's it. Small things, day to day activities, celebrate small wins, like Masi said. Very important. Every time you do an activity, like you've de dealt with your stack of paper today, mm -hmm. do your favorite thing. Watch a movie, have a glass of wine, whatever it is you like to do. It motivates yeah. you to do the next thing tomorrow. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's not a sprint. It's it's a marathon. It's it's not even. In fact, I call decluttering. It's not a project. The minute mm. you begin to look at hold, uh, decluttering as a project, so when you're mm. done with the project, what what will what will be the next thing you do? On to the it's, next. It's, yeah, a, it's, yeah. it's habit. Decluttering is a habit. Yeah. It's stuff okay. that you okay. do every day. And before you know it, you really don't have a clutter problem. We're very insightful. This is the things that we take for granted. We never even stop to think about it, to be honest. Uh, it's just something now I've been thinking and I was going through my house thinking, okay, yeah, that, and yes, there's that, and also there's that. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I need to re-examine things and where my home, my home for my home things are. Uh, but yeah, okay, I just want to say thank you very much to Julia, Mercy, and Pamela. Despite the technical issues we had, I mean, it's been a very insightful conversation. I've learned a lot, and I hope our viewers have as well. Uh, I'm going to bring in Martin now, because I know you usually love to give uh, your parting yeah. shot. Uh, so please enlighten us. <laughs> been very interesting listening to all this stuff. I, <clears throat> I spent some time with my grandmother in Europe, and she grew up during the Second World War. And hoarding is not only in Kenya, it also happens there. I think it's that whole thing, as you've mentioned, you don't want to lose stuff, you want to hang on to things. You don't know where, whether tomorrow your, your fortunes will change again to where you've come from and so on and so forth. So, yep, I, I've, I've seen that also. But um, as usual, I have a parting shot. I have something to share over here. And uh, this is from Melissa Kamara Wilkins. If your stuff isn't serving you, it won't serve you any better packed away in a box somewhere. So by all means, get rid of stuff. Give, find someone to give them to, give them to a home somewhere. You, you know, there's always somewhere that you can give your stuff off to. And I like uh, what... Uh, um, Juliet mentioned for every one thing you bring into the house, make sure you remove one or two. I think, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all for yes, joining Maxi. us. Um, yes, Maxi, I think Maxi has one more. Thing no, I also wanted to and, say, uh, like, just two, yes, please, two, let's hear it. yeah, two, two parting shots from me. Um, mm -hmm. is um, your clutter is someone else's treasure, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my number one rule. And what you think cannot be beneficial to someone else, trust me, it's beneficial. Whether it's torn or it's, it will be beneficial to someone else. And then... You see, you see when it gets juicy and then the internet decides that we don't want to hear from her. Even yeah, internet has a lot of clutter. <laughs> so it would seem. Ah. Man. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. Okay. Uh, I, I do like what you said about the old, somebody's clutter is somebody else's treasure. Um, exactly. That's one way to think about it. And, then, and I mean, well, it's not to say that we always, I mean, when people hear about charities and things like that, you know, when you look at it from a perspective of, you know, um, from that kind of perspective, it, it takes on a, a slightly different kind of meaning from that uh, from that side. Yeah. Masi is back. Let's let's hear the second point, Masi. I, we all uh, in agreement, we love the first one. Your the first one was okay, out. fine. Okay, yeah. fine. For my second one is, if you can't see it, you don't need it. Like, if okay. you're digging through stuff to look for it, trust me, you don't, you, you, you don't need that item. You have to, like, just make sure whatever it is you have, you're able to see where it is. So if you can't see it, you don't need it. And then my last rule is, uh, if you've not used it in the past six months, trust me, you might not use it ever, and you might not need it ever. Very true. Yeah. I, yeah. I think we need to have a we need we need to have a sidebar then. <laughs> Which also reminds me of something I was watching over the weekend um, on Netflix uh, about small houses, something tiny houses or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see a lot of people who are, are also deciding to let go of their mm -hmm. big um, mansions and spaces and moving into smaller properties and houses with less, mm -hmm. uh, less stuff. And you just feel kind of you know. Uh, yeah, relieved in a way. Anyway, 
Thank you so much. Time has come for us to sadly say good night. Um, we're grateful for, for the show, uh, for joining us this evening, spending an hour with Wawero and I, and of course, uh, sharing your knowledge and insights on hoarding. So to those watching us, um, see you next week with a, another exciting uh, topic to talk about. Have a good evening, and uh, you know where to find us every Monday. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh.